as part of something we call the Haystack Future Ed Initiative. Um, if you go to our website, you'll find out more about the initiative. But the main thing we're doing right now is connecting three classes, a class at Duke University, a class at Stanford University, and a class at University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm Kathy Davidson at Duke. Um, You'll be hearing from David Palumbo Lewis Stanford, and today uh, in the hot seat is going to be Chris Newfield at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Um, he very kindly is here today to talk about his book, The Unmaking of the Public University. Um, but before we do that, we'll show you the times of the other Google Hangouts. These are public. You're welcome to join us through um, Google and Google Air. And uh, you now on your screen are seeing the Hangouts for um, the rest of the semester. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Chris to all of you. Um, first of all, here's his book, The Ma Unmaking of the Public University, one of the most influential books on higher education of the last several decades. Uh, Chris Newfield teaches American Studies in the English Department at UC Santa Barbara. His books include Ivy and Industry, Business and the Making, Unmaking and the Making of the American University, 1800 to 1980, and Unmaking the Public University: The 40-Year Assault on the Middle Class. He's also the re article, recent author of recent articles on solar energy policy and collaboration in nanoscience. He blogs on higher education funding and policy at Remaking the University, and we can put up the URL for his um, blog and at the Huffington Post and the Chronicle of Higher Education. And he's right now completing a book called Lower Education, What to Do About Our Downsized Future. He's <laughs> now going to talk to us for about 10 minutes about his um, book. And Chris, over to you. Hi, right, great. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. And I'm hoping that the echo I'm hearing now is not permanent. Can, I, I muted one of the mics. Are you hearing an echo feedback? We are. Okay, how about this? I think that's better. Yeah. How about that? Can you still hear me if I, I'm working on the remote mic now that's in the class instead of on my laptop? How's that? That's good. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just going to say something quickly about my personal background in relation to this book because I think that that uh, is, is relevant. Um, I'm second generation college. Uh, both of my parents were the first and, and the only people in their families to go to college. Everyone had basically struggled before that to get through high school and then get into either the blue collar or sort of what we would now call the pink collar workforce. And so I grew up with um, stories of the anomaly of the two sides of the family. One um, was my mother who had come to this campus, uh, UC Santa Barbara, in the 50s when it was still a normal school for basically teaching people how to become teachers, which is what she did. She taught reading in the first and second grade when she graduated in the early 50s. And it wasn't until after she left really the late 50s and early 60s that the state decided to transform a teacher's college into a full-scale, uh, not just State College, but a research university, which is what it became afterwards. And then my father was um, really sort of Culver City blue collar who had gone to Santa Monica City College and ended up through a series of flukes going to USC and then to medical school from there. And so the the it was very clear to me just growing up in my family that there had been a massive discontinuous leap from the sort of the democratic New Deal generation who had never owned a car, never owned any kind of property, and it had a fairly circumscribed sense of their life opportunities, their possibilities for travel, and equally importantly, their capacity for having sort of an individual voice in the society that the society would listen to. Two of my parents, who although they were not activists, felt that they would be listened to, that their economic needs would be uh, addressed by the society, that that's what the society was kind of there for. And of course, as part of that, they immediately switched from the Democrats to Republicans and moved to the suburbs. You know, it was really that kind of trajectory. And they became uh, Eisenhower conservatives and remained fairly conservative, at least um, up through the, the 1980s. Um, I wanted this thing that happened to my family to be available or 
for everyone that came through the society. And it was pretty obvious by the 70s and 80s that the nature of the society, racially in particular, um, was changing. And so the book came out of my concern that the, the really the no limits ambition that my parents had benefited from um, was off. That deal was off. That the society wasn't going to do that for people anymore. And I was you know, very disturbed by what seemed to me to be the obvious thing that had changed, the most obvious thing that had changed, which is essentially the racial, racial structure of California, which had gone from being 85% white uh, when my parents were going through it to being now minority white, and on its way to that throughout the 70s and the 80s and the 90s when these decisions were being made. Okay, so basically there's a there's a simple narrative arc that um, the book this, the book tells or describes goes through, and that is um, that there was a period when the leaders of industrial societies, not just in the United States but especially here. Uh, really valued the output of only a small elite. You know, the 19th century, uh, the, my first book was on Ralph Walter Emerson. He was a huge proponent of um, individualism, but also of um, what he called natural aristocracy, so pilot high school education and small groups of elite. I'm sorry, we just lost the last one. Okay. Um. <laughs> anyway, so that was true of the 19th century. What happened? We're back. Okay. Um, most of the 20th, and it really changed at the af after World War II, where at at some point, um, society's leaders feel like they need a fairly large um, semi-elite of people. And then uh, what, I, what the book is arguing is that with the economic changes of the 1970s and the 1980s, coupled with the, um, certain cultural anxiety about the way that American society was essentially integrating, uh, they became less convinced that this kind of large or majoritarian college-educated middle class was important for the health and future of the society in the way that they had previously assumed. So what this does um, in terms of the, the history of the institutions of higher learning is that it makes people feel like the pu large-scale public funding of public universities that had initially created um, a 75 or 80 percent um, of all students' public university system was no longer necessary. Or more to the point, it wasn't necessary to see it as a public good that taxpayers needed to pay for. And equally importantly, it wasn't necessary that it all be of high quality, that you could go back to something like the stratification of it. So in the University of California system in the 1990s, one of the things that I talk about in those chapters is the way that uh, a system in which all the campuses were supposed to become equal over a period of decades, distinct but nonetheless equal, became again a, a, a system of flagships in which the UCLA and Berkeley, the two oldest campuses, would be um, much more selective than the other campuses. And during that same period, uh, there was quite a bit of talk of demoting the other campuses back to being much more like Cal State's. And then this is something that people continue to talk about. As part of that particular discussion, um, there was a lot of talk about how uh, there were too many, for example, Chicanos getting into Berkeley with lower GPAs than was the case for the white and Asian American students who are already there. So the, the racial dimension of this um, and the egalitarian dimension of this got sort of bound together and stigmatized. So the second part of the book is, is about how those two things go together. In a nutshell, really, the, um, the thing that the whole book is concerned about is the simultaneity or the indissociability of culture wars and budgetary wars, that things that no longer seem affordable or really desirable or in the top five things that a state needs to spend its money on come to seem that way as the result of cultural shifts. So it's not a, it's not really so much a question of a small group of, of um, 
you know, billionaires and their political operatives making a series of rational decisions about how the society needs to be restructured. It's much more um, a, a change in what Raymond Williams called the structure of feeling in a society in which um, a group, and I'm calling this in the book the, the middle class, but it's a, obviously racially and, and in terms of class, you know, income also quite distinct, uh, multifarious. It itself no longer feels entitled to make the kinds of demands today about free access, about high quality that it was it felt entitled to make um, in the 50s and 60s and the 70s. Uh, there's just a couple of other things that I'll say before I stop, and that is um, that I'm very concerned. I talk about this early in the book about the stagnation of American cultural capabilities, as I call them. In other words, the ability to um, negotiate differences within a society and across societies. And I think that this is connected to the, the marginalization and also the, the impoverishment at most universities of humanities disciplines that focus precisely on those things. And then um, secondly, I'm also uh, pretty interested in the, the cultural disadvantage that the United States has now on a, on a global stage. And I saw this when I was running a study abroad programs in France, where the, the, the peers of uh, my really bright students were linguistically much more capable by default, speaking two or three languages is kind of the baseline. But then, you know, not just in, in, in the US and Europe's sort of transatlantic concepts, but globally, and then, you know, broadening out that there's a, um, an interest in liberal arts, in face to face capacity development, in immersive forms of learning, in uh, know how development, in informal sources of consciousness, reason, and understanding in, in uh, communicative capabilities, in teamwork uh, facility capabilities, and so on, that are leading Asian and other, you know, sort of continental cultures towards building up the humanities and integrating them with STEM fields at a very moment in which it seems like the United States is going in the opposite direction. Okay, so those are um, in a mush. Kind of the issues that are working on all together in this book. Great. Thank you, Chris. That's fantastic. Um, should we turn it now to questions from students? There's a document with about 15, last time I saw 15 questions. Maybe uh, is there a student at Stanford that wants to ask a question first and go from there? Yeah. So anybody in this class, you can just come to this um, camera and speak into it. I can volunteer. Yeah. And if people can introduce try. themselves okay. <clears throat> when they make their comment or question, that would be great. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, I'm Gabriele Dillmann. I teach um, German literature and culture and language at Denison University. I'm here by invitation. David invited me because I'm very interested in the format of this interinstitutional inter collaborative project. Um, so, my question uh, I, I, in part, I have an answer to it already because one of the uh, students, I believe, uh, either at Santa Barbara or at Duke, I'm not, not exactly sure, already pointed me to uh, an article that actually picks up on that question. But I'll still ask it. But really, I think it's interesting for, for everybody, and I'm not sure if everybody has read everything. So my question would be that um, the book was published in 2008 the same year that the economy took a huge hit. What has happened to public universities since the economic downturn? Obviously, budget cuts have intensified. What, where or are the consequences of these cuts in regard to their broader implications? Um, so, in basically, what, in summary, the uh, question is, what is, what is the status quo now? Uh, I think it's, whoops. <laughs> We can't hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Is there any feedback from my, um, I think the, the situation is um, that 
everyone is pretty aware now of something that I've, it's felt to me like kind of a more, a slightly more insurgent common, which is the enterprise being attacked or downsized more or less systematically. Um, now I think that this is common knowledge. There have been, you know, there are hundreds of articles every year about the shrinking of the middle class. So I think that that, that has been embedded in sort of general consciousness for better or worse. Uh, the immediate outcome of that has been a kind of fatalism. I'm not sure that people feel more in 2014 uh, like they can you know, fix the economy and, and regrow a middle income job um, more than they did in 2008 or 2007 or 2005. And so we've had a strange period. It's kind of a, I don't know, it's a, a historical, historically speaking, an interlude or where Really, nothing is happening outside of political paralysis, crossed fingers in Europe, and essentially no recovery. Um, in terms of public policy in relation to higher education, the cutting has stopped. There hasn't really been any real recovery uh, in terms of public budgets. At the same time, um, tuition increases are off the table. I mean, this is something I personally think is good because I was always opposed to the sorts of um, shifting of costs from public to students that we saw, have seen really for 20 years. At the same time, it was um, the only uh, sort of, I don't know, other source, you know, the only dam that, that um, administrators, senior managers can open in order to compensate for the cutting on the public side. So the, the simple solution that universities like, like ours, like mine, had used in the past to cover financially, at least keep uh, equilibrium, is gone. Now, the other thing that happened you know, over the last couple of years is that people were looking towards uh, instructional technology to uh, not only improve education, but also to save money, you know, to produce uh, I think and you see the hope was of, in the near future, hundreds of millions of dollars of efficiencies. And I think we're now at a stage where we realize that that isn't going to happen either. So 2014 begins in a state of limbo with no public re funding recovery, no huge tuition increases to make up for the, the flatness or the low current level, uh, and no technological fix. And so I, personally, I, I think that the, I mean, the good news in this is that more people are aware that we have to do something now, that, that, that we're looking at kind of long, slow decline if we don't recover. And um, we're at least, a, we've kind of taken some false solutions off the table and are ready to look for real ones. Thank you. Chris, um, this is David Palumbo here. Just a quick follow-up. Did you listen to the governor's uh, speech this morning? Was there anything particularly interesting about that in terms of education? Uh, just, on a, just on a scam, I, I don't think he mentioned higher ed. But I, I had exactly 15 seconds to read it. Did somebody hear it in here? Um, I, I, listen, I listened to the speech, and the only thing that I heard from uh, Jerry Brown was uh, specifically, he just mentioned the um, uh, like uh, filling the gaps in the budget in by um, prop the propositions and uh, having the, the public mm -hmm. vote on new taxes and stuff like that for education. Whatever. He didn't go into any specifics. He was actually very vague. But uh, it seemed to be that, you know, there's uh, because of uh, the new proposition that was passed, whatever, um, passed in California, whatever, to turn more yeah. money into education, that um, that's what he's kind of going to go towards now is forcing the legislature, you know, instead of making them do everything, it's you have the public vote on it. And, whether or not they want to add money into it. That's Sean that you can't see. Did you hear what he said? Yes, yes. Thank you. Chris, my name is Matthew Clark. I'm a student of public policy here at Duke. My question concerns the intersection between higher education policy and non track faculty. What can you make note of the use and abuse of permanents for uh, contingent faculty in public higher education? Toward the end of our course, I'll be joining the online community in a discussion of institutional change. I agree with you, and I think we all should, that proper public funding should be tied to uh, reversing the growth of adjunct and low-wage teaching staffs. What do you think is the best way to achieve this goal? Uh, many public 
university simply could not function without large numbers of contingent faculty. Increased funding for higher education is a difficult political sell. Uh, is it time to get used to the end of the tenure track, or is there a way that we might preserve it and roll back the large numbers of adjuncts that most of the courses offered by public universities? Can I can I ask one follow up on that? Just related. This is Mitchell Stevens at Stanford. Can someone explain to me why we would want to retain the tenure track? Don't <laughs> worry, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> <laughs> First, uh, I I think the the main reason is uh, to protect professional autonomy on the part of um, professors and researchers <coughs> pursuing um, unpopular research and um, offensive conclusions. And I I the thing that people point out at this point is that well most academic research is incredibly innocuous and doesn't actually offend anyone. Uh, but I, I think that that's a, I mean, that's a problem that can be addressed best within the uh, structure of job security that you know, I personally think we need to retain. I also am in favor of extending it. I think it should be much harder to fire people um, from private industry as well and from K-12. through In other words, I'm not a fan of fire at will. I don't think that it actually improves the uh, the work situation, but that's a whole other uh, story. Just in terms of assuming that we keep tenure track, the question is what then do we do about adjuncts? And for me, the political pressure is for this is going to have to come from students and their parents. Uh, tenure track faculty, I don't think are, I think their interests are divided. That is that you know we have a, a vested interest in maintaining contingency because of the, you know, the number of um, lower wage people that we need to operate laboratories because of teaching assistants in non-STEM fields like in English. So there's a, you know, there's a mixture of, of interest that's kept faculty kind of on the sidelines as a group. On the, at, in a way that doesn't matter because I don't think uh, the media and the public care so much about really what any professional says about their working conditions anymore. I mean, yeah, I think this is even true of physicians who are in some ways are sort of the highest status test cases. But on the other hand, what we saw in California in 2009 and 2011 around um, different kinds of <laughs> years is that the California media is really interested in what students think and is kind of wondering, a couple of reporters actually said this to me directly, of where the parents are in a, saying we don't want to pay so much for this and we can't afford it if we did want to. And then secondly, what exactly are we getting at public universities? Are my kids at a public university you know, getting the same general quality of outcomes as private school students are? You know, should I have actually you know, sold the house and the cars in order to send my kids to Occidental or to promote a college or um, to another school like that instead of sending them to UCLA or to Cal State Northridge? Have I, have I ruined my students' future by putting them into large lectures or into state schools where the professors teach three or four courses at a time, may have 150 students times three to five pieces of submission per class to grade over the course of a, of a 13 to 15 week term? So when those kinds of questions around educational quality and around equality are asked, when parents and students start asking the question, are we setting up a caste system in which we have a small elite of public, sorry, private universities and then a bunch of kind of expanded community colleges for profits for the masses, at that point, I think the political dynamic will change and the money will be found. And I guess I should make explicit one of the premises that, that's in this book that, that sometimes get lost, gets lost in these discussions, something I've done a lot of research on. There is the money to do this. We can do it. There's no absence of money either in the state of California or in the state of North Carolina or in the nation as a whole. It's just a question of where we spend the money that we have. Thank you, Chris. Is that an answer? Did, did that make sense to you? 
Yes, thank you, Chris. <laughs> I'm Kelly speaking for everyone. I'm speaking for all. It was a fine <laughs> answer, Chris. And I'm live tweeting it, by the way. Uh -oh. oh, hi. I'm Christina Davidson. I'm the and, uh, my original question had to do with the last six years, uh, particularly around the uh, issue of affirmative action and whether you had any comments about uh, kind of how things have been <laughs> on, the, uh, <laughs> on that issue uh, in our educational system. But I was also interested in your introduction. Um, you're talking about uh, the international scene and how our students are less prepared as we go and uh, converse with students abroad. And I'm wondering if you have any commentary about how to either fix our curriculum or fix our uh, educational structure. Yeah, those are, those are really important questions. Um, I, I see affir uh, the affirmative action debates as more or less a, just a racial wedge issue. The analysis in the book is that uh, it, the raising of the specter of affirmative action allowed whites to feel that their children or they themselves as students were not getting into the colleges that they wanted to get into, not because the college systems hadn't been expanding properly, not because regional colleges were not upgrading so that they were on a comparable quality with the flagships, uh, and not because, and this is I think the crucial thing, because their kids weren't really all that great. You know, they were kind of like mediocre white people who had a, you know, a good post-World War II sense of entitlement, but not really the skills to make them absolute standouts, but because their slots have been taken by African Americans or Chicanos. So the, the argument that it, it occurred in Texas, it occurred in California, it occurred everywhere, was to basically set up a simple binary trade-off between um, the white student getting in or the black or brown student getting in. And that was the analysis of the Hopwood decisions that I go through in the, in the book, as well as some of the other material, was arguing that in a, in a more egalitarian culture, it would have been relatively easy for people to look at the first Hopwood decision and look at other judicial precedents and just think about how the society works in general and how resources are being allocated and think, oh yeah, it's true, you know, Cheryl Hopwood, like, she forgot to fill out her essay in which she talked about having a disabled child, but she didn't, nobody even knew about that, and her grades were not that great, so maybe she could have, should have put that stuff in, but in any case, the real issue is not, you know, Cheryl should be able to go to a good law school, but we should have more law schools so that she can do that, even though she's not as good as a lot of other people. That in a meritocracy two kind of a culture, which we had the elements of before in place, thanks to post-war expansion, thanks to the civil rights, thanks to you know decades of efforts on the part of a whole bunch of people, thanks to the Communist Party in the 1930s and its racial solidarities, thanks to the Popular Front, thanks to government programs coming out of the New Deal. Um, we have the elements of that in place, and one of the things that is happening is the use of classical racial wedge issues to roll that back, weaken the egalitarian understanding of how competition is working, so that you don't say, we have to reduce competition. We have to provide more good stuff for all the good people that we have. We need 100% of people having post-secondary quality credentials. Instead of having that discussion, we had a uh, the discussion in which there's a scarcity of resources, we re-stratify it, and then when people don't get into the top thing, we do the sort of racial finger pointing, I and mean, that's basically it. Uh, you asked, I think it was you, Tina, is that right? Um, whether the middle class is still majority white, I mean, I think you're pointing to an important issue, which is that middle class is always kind of coded white. And, but that too was changing until these some of the rollback discourses of the the 90s and um, more recently under the Bush administration. Um, and then the second, in terms of uh, global competition, look, it's just we can't we've lost 
routine production and we've lost routine white collar work to other countries, to lower cost countries. So the idea that we are going to gear up the factory production side of American higher education by growing community colleges as they currently are. It's just, it's just suicidal. What we need to be doing is growing the top, taking the Dukes and the Stanfords and the public flagships and spreading those kinds of techniques to the rest of the population. I don't, I don't have a you know, full answer as to whether the entire planet can do basically creative knowledge work at the same time and pay everybody to do that at once. And I think that's the, the challenge that we're going to have to be figuring out how to, how to deal with. But what I do know is that um, we, we need, we're stuck in mid-market in public universities in particular. We don't have enough money to scramble up and produce really high quality skills for enough people, but we don't want to scramble down market because there's basically no jobs there for us anymore. So the, I mean, we can we can have a discussion later about the specific um, skills that I think need to be taught, and there are a lot of really good questions about that. So maybe I'll hold off on that. Question from someone from UCSB or Stanford. Okay, we have one from here. Good. <coughs> Hi. Um, I'm Natasha. I'm a sophomore here studying philosophy. And the question I have is sort of about this concept that you mentioned of growing the top and providing access to the kind of knowledge that we produce here at uh, Duke, Stanford, UCSB, and spreading that out. And so that's something that sort of comes up with this idea of MOOCs and online education. I'm wondering if you think that it's possible for technology to allow us to reach the vision of providing everyone with access to the kind of education that we want them to be able to access, or whether that sort of goes back to the CAC system that you were talking about earlier when we distinguish between private institutions and public institutions. And what we, I guess what we're doing in this class is sort of re-envisioning what the classroom will look like to make it accessible to everyone. But does re-envisioning mean that we're also sacrificing quality? And just what, what are your thoughts in, with regards to those concerns? Are you, are you partly asking me about technology also? With using technology? Right. Right, yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm kind of a fan of blended solutions, you know, trying to bring face-to-face -to -face together with uh, technological extensions. I just don't think we've worked it out yet, but there's all sorts of great work being done. Um, I'm opposed to the online-only version, because I, I don't think the, I think we have pretty decent evidence now that it doesn't work as well, and so, you know, my concern is that lower income people, um, people that are actually um, always already at risk for not getting educational attainments to the same level as the rest of the society are the ones that will be slotted into those uh, types of services. And I, I think what we learned last year about MOOCs, you know, one of the things is that they work best for people who are already really great learners. So for example, um, although I don't think the, the cost savings are there, I do think the educational benefits from having an online a master's program in you know, computer science and, and Georgia Tech and the Georgia Tech Udacity Partnership, that that makes an educational kind of sense that um, the San Jose State entry level or remedial math courses. Do. I'm I'm an optimist about most things, and I'm also optimistic that we're going to do a better job in 10 years or 20 years of figuring out um, how to combine those things so that we can have universal access. I and I guess the other thing I would say at this juncture is I think we just have to set the universal quality standard as our goal. In other words, it's not just access so that everybody can be looking at a lecture. It's that everybody, you know, 100% of the people that want to get involved in this um, are able to get the, the learning devices, that are the learning tools that uh, the people at high-end places get. 
you know, just one last thing. I mean, we, it's, we really have a Coles to Newcastle or rich get richer kind of situation in American higher education today where the, the weakest learners get the fewest resources in community colleges. And the people who've proven their whole lives and they're fantastic learners get up to 10 times more per, per head um, and the private universities compared to what's happening in community colleges. And that's just upside down. Once we decide to turn the whole system right side up, I think actually our technology is going to develop more quickly and in a better direction than it has, say, in the last 20 years or so. Thank you. We have another, an, another someone from Stanford, but maybe it's Santa Barbara's turn, or maybe they get enough turns with Mr. Newfield. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they get more turns with me than they ever have. Um, all right, well, this is Stanford. Right, well, actually, there is a, there's a question for someone who's sitting right next to me. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> can you go over here and ask your question? I'm going to have it on the page. Someone else live tweeting in there? We have a bunch of live tweeters here in, in uh, Durham, and I think there's some at Stanford at UCSB, too. Yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. Hi, Hi there I'm seeing her still seeing myself. Oh, yeah. It's really lagging. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is Ryan. Ryan, go ahead. All right. Um, my question was regarding Chapter 8 and the knowledge managers for the KM system. Um, so I was wondering where these managers were hired from, um, to, like assuming that they weren't from the other four quadrants, since the people from the university weren't being hired, and since they weren't unique, um, they weren't able to rise farther in the KM system. I'm getting a power cord. Uh, and then there was also the talk about the shareholders and the investors. I wasn't sure if that was a part of where the camp managers were coming from, since it was clear that the people graduating from the university weren't, um, weren't good enough to be in a better role in the business system. And how hopefully we can make people from the university have the more unique characteristics. Um, so they can find a better place in business. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, that was my question. That was you. You kept focused brilliantly. My computer was about to die, so I just got plugged in. Can you turn it? Can you hear me? Your picture is frozen. This question of knowledge management, you know, that nobody really uses the term anymore, but I think the, the general structure of it has just kind of gotten codified. I mean, Kathy, you would, you would have more expertise on this question than, than I do. Um, the, those folks come from a lot of different backgrounds, and it, they don't necessarily come from one part of the higher education system, but they tend to be STEM oriented, um, they often have gone to business school. Uh, they tend not to be people that have what are increasingly people that have gone to good schools, they've gotten very good grades, but they haven't necessarily developed a specific um, and unique skill set or set of, um, of interests and, and capacities that would allow them to, um, you know, to a purist need to a particular industry or a particular company. Um, and the second thing, a piece of that that I think is really important is that we were talking about earlier when Brian came in to help with the setup, and that is that they uh, they tend to they have to be structurally closer to the product and a product that has a, a solid, if not sort of semi-monopolistic market position. So that people that are doing um, operations that are that are hard to do, and where even though there aren't a lot of people that know how to do them, if they're not um, if they're not that close to the 
what seems to be the value add of, we're talking about the design function at Apple. Like that. If they're remote from that, if they're doing support services, even though the support service is really difficult, what you will try to do is pay them as little as possible, and then if you, if they're still too expensive, you'll just find somebody in the Ukraine or in another state or someone else to do this hard to replace, but nonetheless kind of uh, not that valuable to the immediate bottom line job. So I guess that one way to put this is it doesn't mean you can't get in this um, into this group by going to community, if you only go to community college, if you go to a state school. But what it does mean is that one has to strategize very carefully about the particular industry that one is targeting. That's one of the things that we're planning on doing in this class as we go, is thinking about the industries and what their natures are that you might want to enter. And the reason for that is just that the generic degree, the generic credential is just not working anymore for either security or good salary. That's the three quarters of that group that aren't, you know, just getting started. Question. Question. Yeah. We have one here. Uh, uh, Stu Levin, Stanford University. Uh, my background's oil industry, but I'm actually a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's possible. <laughs> yeah, it, it's more frequent than you think. Uh, so mine was that question five about smoking gun. Um, this was a scholarly work that had a different flavor than many I've read. And I felt like I kept getting a strong impression that you were stating, saying or implying strongly that there was this conspiracy of conservatives. And I was kind of looking, was there a smoking gun of actual collaboration between groups? Or was it, what's the nuance of that, uh, that uh, implication? The, um, there. We see it across my camera on my laptop, but you can still see me. The uh, main source around the university rethinking was the Powell memo, the Powell manifesto of 1970. Uh, but I want to stress that it isn't really a conspiracy or a question of you know small groups of people coordinating this tightly. It's more um, a cultural change that affected different groups of people in somewhat similar ways, and then in different states and with different political agenda, uh, started to push things away from, say, sort of egalitarian understandings of how higher education should function or egalitarian understandings of uh, race relations and towards more hierarchical ones with the implication that if hierarchy is natural, if we have a sort of natural aristocracy situation, if only one or ten percent of the, you know, the population is really smart and really adds value, then we don't need to spend so much money educating the, the broader masses to a sort of a high quality level and that goes for other kinds of public services as well. Maybe, so that, the, you know, the Powell memo was really influential in kind of a back stage way. And then what the book also looks at is, again, not a, you know, it's not a conspiracy, but it's a kind of a, the creation of a thought world through uh, think tanks, through in, the op-ed pages of influential newspapers, uh, through conferences that, you know, occur on a, on a yearly basis through lobbying organizations that get set up. And um, an example of the sort of the op-ed world was um, Arthur Schlesinger's book, The Disuniting of America, which was initially um, funded by a corporation and then ended up getting published as a regular book in 1992. Schlesinger is a famous liberal Democrat who was you know, kind of the chronicler of the Camelot version of the JFK administration. So he has kind of impeccable Democrat Party credentials, and he came out in the early 90s as the, you know, after the Stanford Cannon Wars um, had lost, you know, some public attention and after the sort of the political correctness up, uh, upsurge of 90 and 91 was beginning to die down. And the book comes out and argues that really the, it's not true that all races are created equal culturally. He argues that of uh, Europe is culturally superior to other parts of the world. So it's not it's not really white supremacism in the, in the old racial sense, but it is a kind of West supremacism in the sense that 
democratic values and market freedoms and the things that we value in the United States, we, you know, being that, that sort of descended from England group that he's most focused on, that these all come basically from British culture and from a small number of Western countries. So this book is like, you know, it's, well, wow, you know, this liberal agrees that we've gone too far in extending opportunity to all racial groups, some of whom don't seem to be taking the most, you know, as much advantage of them as they should be. So maybe we've been wasting our money. And a lot of, I mean, you know, this happened in my family, family and friends. You know, it's not that people think, and this is where culture is important and not as opposed to conspiracy or just conscious deliberative decision making. It's just, you know, culture works through kind of um, uneasiness or just an emotional shift where making sure that, you know, that UC Santa Barbara or Irvine, you know, which is, is by 1990 majority Asian American, Making sure that Irvine has all the money it needs to be as good as Berkeley because, you know, all the Asian American kids whose parents immigrated to Orange County from South Vietnam or whatever, you know, fill in the blank for there's lots of examples of this. They deserve to have just as much as the students at Berkeley and the students at Stanford. That feeling just kind of died away. It's like, oh, well, I guess it's true that you know, we really should be putting our resources into the parts of the culture that produce the most important values and that have also done the most for the economy. <coughs> and so people just don't show up to pay taxes in the same sort of distributed way. I mean, that's an example of the, how the thinking works without negating the role then of more organized groups, think tanks, and so on behind all of that. Well, thank you. So I guess this question has a lot of value to me. Um, in your book, you often point to the university focus, the economic slash output potential of future students slash graduates. And science kids. So I was wondering how Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, We're only picking up the name every eight words. Uh, oh. Ready, we'll sound <laughs> Try again a little louder, maybe. Yes. Now? Can you say your name again? Leslie. Leslie? Now? Yes, speak very loudly. <laughs> very loudly. Um, okay, once again, I'm Leslie. I'm an undeclared sophomore um, at Duke University, so this question has a lot of value to me. Um, so in your book, you often point to the university's focus on the economic slash output potential of future students slash graduates. And I'm still here. Um, so that yields some uh, stratification amongst humanities and sciences people. Uh, so in terms of that, how can a university not be subject to the powers of supply and demand? So in that sense, like, what do you see the value of an education subject to these bonds? And is it realistic to think that a university could exist without supply and demand? Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we are now in a, in a situation where the market is the default and public goods or sort of the public sector is a, a seems like the anomaly. But that's arbitrary. It could be the other way around. It appears in our history it has been the other way around. In other words, first you, first the society makes collaborative, and we could even call them democratic decisions, to provide for certain functions at a level that everyone deems necessary. And for example, healthcare, another is a area where we have had these kinds of debates. And then the society is essentially taxed. You know, it pays as a collective, as a group, for the full provisioning of those institutions in whatever realm they may be. 
So if, if we, that simple answer to your question is, yeah, we can just, we can put higher education on a public good basis and it won't be subject to the laws of supply and demand. And it doesn't mean that we will just spend as much money as we want or whatever we want. We'll still have, we'll actually have better accountability than we do right now because there'll be, you know, sort of more public transparency and more awareness of who's getting what. Um, but it, it does mean that it would be, uh, it would, you know, these kind of the democratization of tertiary education, of post-secondary education, uh, in the way that we, you know, 100, what, 20 years ago decided we had to democratize high school. <coughs> Long periods of, of American history, high school was optional. There was no, societies didn't think they had to figure out how to get everybody the opportunity to finish the 10th grade or the 12th grade. And then at some point, economic forces and, you know, I prefer to think sort of cultural enlightenment kicked in and people saw that we really need everyone educated at least to the age of 17 or 18 to pretty a pretty sophisticated level of quantitative and qualitative data processing. You know, at least, you know, know something about the history of this society, know something about other societies, all that stuff. Now it looks to me like we're, we're pretty much on the threshold where we, ne we need to get everybody at least to grade 14 and we probably should get everybody to grade 16. And if that's the case, if we're serious about that, then we publicly provide for that. We tax um, and we make at least, you know, the public universities of the world free. And we can do it. There's no reason why we can't do that. But I think we should. Uh, I have a question, if there's still time. Kathy, is there still time? Are we, st are we still on? Okay. Uh, this is Mitchell Stevens at Stanford, and uh, uh, Chris, it's very nice to uh, encounter you uh, virtually. I'll, I'll look forward to, to something uh, more material at some point. Um, I have long appreciated the, uh, the, the breadth of, of your critique of, of our sector um, and the consistency of it. Um, there's, uh, there's something that came up earlier that is sort of right at the heart of uh, what we're talking about here at Stanford with uh, online learning and also, um, as you know, in, in national discourse, and that is that is how we know what quality is in, in higher education. And it, it struck me in some of your remarks earlier that you, you kind of equated uh, selective admissions research universities as being quality and, uh, and other kinds of institutions as having lower quality. But uh, it strikes me that we there is very little systematic uh, information about about educational quality at either the undergraduate or the graduate level by any metric other than returns to earnings. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about uh, how how you think we ought to be thinking about quality in higher education, um, and in a, an era in which we are increasingly called upon to to measure quality, you know, what kind of measures um, we might be looking for, or if you think returns to earning and um, job placement are kind of sufficient metrics uh, for quality um, in your conversation. I, I think that selectivity is a false proxy for quality, but it's one that, you know, we've used in American culture. I don't agree with it, but there it is. I, a better proxy is uh, instructional expenditures. I do think there's proportionality between rough proportionality between inputs in terms of money and outputs in terms of educational quality. In terms of metrics, um, this is a really good question. I mean, I just, you know, <laughs> I say partly because I don't have really any idea what the answer is. Um, I think that student self-assessment is important. You know, business schools do this. How? What was your experience like? What? What do you think you learned? Uh, I think that if we could figure out how to do the resources on this, qualitative uh, professor assessments that go beyond letter grades and GPAs are also important. You know, I went to a college where <coughs> you had letter grades on any submitted work ever. You actually had to go to the registrar's office to find out what your GPA was when you wanted to apply to medical school or whatever it was you were going to do. And that really focused everyone's attention on the content of the interaction. And I think that, you know, if we could put our heads together and develop qualitative assessments around educational outcomes for, 
for public consumption as well. I, I'm going to push you a little bit here because I'm, I'm trying to imagine a world in which edu academics say to Washington, um, the metric for quality is the amount of money you give us. And the other metric is going to be um, you know, qualitative student-centered assessments of satisfaction. I, mean, I just don't imagine a world uh, in the near future in which those kinds of um, demands are going to be politically reasonable. You, um, you mean in combination or either of them? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I'm th it, 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 the, the imperative to frankly quantitative measurement is only going to get higher and uh, it's there's it's very clear to me that as teaching and learning become data sciences um, and uh, our friends the engineers decide that teaching and learning are worthy of their attentions that we are going to see a, a wholesale reorganization of what counts as educational measurement and you know boy I prefer to not let the engineers figure that all out by themselves um, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm wondering if, if if I'm just if I'm just you know drowning in Silicon Valley pablum, or you know if that comes up um, you know down the coast, or um, how how we ought to be thinking about this. Um, I I just think we have to insist on a qualitative dimension that we will have to do more work on in order to define and engineer. Mm -hmm. You all have thoughts about versus participation have work. Yeah. Or is it it's mostly can I, can I jump in here? Yes. Just to sort of just sort of to round this off. I mean one of the whole reasons we're doing this future ed initiative is to think about what other metrics we might come up with. You know, badging being one of them and badging not as a substitute for grades, but trying to figure out new pathways towards different kinds of competencies that might in fact be more interesting competencies than the ones we're measuring now, but also I think, you know, academics were very, very quick to dismiss online learning and MOOCs in a cynical way. The uncynical version of MOOCs was the aspiration, I'm not saying it's realized, but the aspiration that if you took away cost and took away prerequisites and took away any admission requirements that in fact there would be some people that would excel. We haven't gotten there yet, but it bothered me that academics so quickly got rid of that aspiration as well as that implementation and efficacy. And I think one thing what, that would be worth our, our, our while is to think if there would be ways to get rid of prerequisites and costs if in fact we could find a different kind of qualitative excellence in the world that isn't measured by current metrics which so clearly graph onto income inequality. I mean we know that how you do on test scores graphs so perfectly onto family and neighborhood income. You know, if we could get rid of some of those barriers, what could we find out? I don't think we're there yet, but even asking that question at this moment seems like a turning point. And I'm hoping our collaboration across these three classes and inspired by your incredible book, um, Chris, but and also by your work, Mitchell, and all of our work, will help us to think in a more sophisticated way and maybe change an international conversation. Um, I've been talking to a lot of Asian countries about Finnish education because the, they do very well on metrics and they're miserable and they are all looking to Finland as a counterexample. British Columbia is about to, this, the province of British Columbia has changed its K-12 through system and is thinking of getting rid of metrics. I think many people at the same time who are using metrics are really fed up and many parents there's a movement in New York called the Stop Testing Movement in New York. We have stuff we can build on here and elucidate, and I think we're at that moment where this, to use our phrase, it's not a MOOC, it can be a movement, and I'm really happy to have this conversation start us off. I think I think our time is over. Do you want to make some final statement, Chris? Some closing statement? Well, I, does any do you, any any of you want to throw something out that we haven't talked about? I have one question. Yeah, Kathy. Yeah, can oh. you come in so she can see you? Hi, Kathy. Uh, <laughs> Professor Davidson. Uh, I read a part of your book about. Um, can you hear? Can you hear yes, me? I can, I can yeah, hear. Yeah, we can hear. Right, so you talked about how um, a lot of the uh, we live in a 21st century world in a workplace that's kind of fit for the 20th century. And um, how when we move to that new, um, like the information technology sector, and we need to start 
you said work kind of like Google, but not really at that level, but not with the cubicles and the, um, the industrial age uh, work theory. Um, how do you like relate that to like the fact that we still need like a lot of blue collar workers, and so if we get rid of grades and stuff like that in high school, like if everybody can't work in in this new information technology sector. I'm not saying that everybody Just has the can. ability to, <laughs> but like. I, yeah. Seven billion people right, right. can't do that together. There are there are going to be people that need to work other jobs. You know, we can't have machines do all of them. I don't right. think. I'll, I'll talk cool. about that when it's my turn. But just briefly, I think the devastation to vocational training in this country is one of the worst things we've done to the um, to the working middle class, to the blue collar middle class. It's one of the reasons Detroit is now um, in the situation it's in. It's a. I think it's the in some ways a bigger travesty than what we've done to tuition costs and public education costs for other higher education. And I think we have to rethink all of education together. I could not agree with, I passionately, passionately could not agree with you more um, about what's happened to what used to be vocational training in this, in this country and uh, how, how little there is um, of that anymore in the United States and uh, what that's done to the working class in this country. But I think that'll be another one. Chris, do you have a final thing you want to say? And I think we'll probably end here for the public YouTube. We might want to stay online as a group and talk about a possible collaborative project. Yeah, I just, I guess the, the link that I would draw between the post metrics project, which I completely support and, and think is very important, um, is to two other things. One has to do with, uh, with funding. I mean, I just, it's, it's so important that we not have this resource starvation in which there's a, a just the, the large majority of schools are essentially consumers of new metric ideas or new educational ideas that are being produced by better resource yes, yes. people. It's just it's inefficient and it's unjust. And I, I'm not, I know I'm not saying anything you don't agree with, but I always want to keep the funding piece in the mix. And then the other thing that I would throw in that was important to me in writing the book is the is aspiration, ambition, and hope. You know the incredible joy that I associate with um, with college life, with learning, with the university space, um, with you know certain kinds of um, artistic, aesthetic, and intellectual risk taking, with self discovery, with travel, with all the things that a robust uh, and completely inclusive the university system makes possible. So um, I'm always connecting those kind of three issues: the money and the, you know, the uh, I don't know, the emotional openness of higher education, together with the technical changes that you, you know, quite rightly have been focusing on the last few years. I love that. Great ending. Thank you, Stanford and UCSB. Thanks so much, Chris, for. Um, kicking off our first Google Hangout. We will make sure we get out the word about the other ones and we'll pass around and spread around the URL for this one. I think we're going to close now our YouTube session and we'll now go into a very brief collaborative session across our three universities. So goodbye to the world. Hello UCSB and Stanford. <laughs> Bye world. Bye world. Bye world. Bye world. Bye world. <laughs> <laughs> Are we off? <laughs> <laughs> no.